So we're recording now. Uh, good evening, or whatever time you're watching. This is Dr. Anderson, and uh, we want to talk about biofilms. And the reason it's a special web call is it, it, it's a bunch of new information that I've been presenting for the last few months, and uh, it I didn't want to wait until August or September when our normal cycle starts over again for the web calls. Uh, the other th reason is, is that we had uh, some of this information that we're going to do tonight on a, on a web call about six or seven months ago, and with the amount that we've uh, done as far as patient care with this and research into it and uh, trying to see cause and effect with uh, different ways of treating biofilms and then looking into uh, more of the depth of, you know, what, what really are biofilms and what can we do about them, I decided to update it. So this is not only going to be a new uh, web call that has some other information, but also it's going to replace the uh, earlier biofilm uh, section that we did a while back. So that's the background for it, for those of you who uh, haven't been on a web call or were wondering why we're repeating a topic. It's because there's actually some new stuff and, and I think some important things to uh, go over and talk about. So we are going to move forward now. Um, so again, there's nothing I'm going to talk about tonight that I make any money from. Um, as most of you know, I teach for almost everybody, and I have teaching uh, consulting contracts with almost everybody in the universe, but none of, nothing I'm going to talk about makes me any money in case I mention a lab or anything like that. Uh, other than knowing the people, I don't, I don't have any uh, financial interest from doing anything as far as product development or lab development for anybody. In case you were wondering, the June and July uh, schedule that we have, the regular June one uh, coming up uh, in a couple, uh, three weeks, uh, is going to be blood pressure medications, both prescribing and tapering, and then July will be uh, steroids prescribing and tapering. And if you if you're on the web calls, you know this is kind of a series that we've done on uh, pharmacology and prescribing and tapering, and uh, we're going to be sending out a new survey for those of you who are on the regular web calls as to uh, what uh, what topics you want to prioritize for the coming uh, six or eight months. So that that survey will be going out to everybody who's on the calls uh, within the next probably three or four weeks. So uh, today. What I want to talk about, and again, if you're not used to being on these calls or you're, you know, you don't remember, um, we'll go through. I have some information that I definitely want to get through, uh, but I really, if you have questions as we're going along, please type them in. There's a little dialog box that you can type questions into, and it'll alert me, and I'll either answer them as we go or I'll answer uh, maybe if there's a more appropriate time coming up. The other thing is uh, uh, this one, because I just got the uh, PowerPoint finally updated last night, um, we didn't get it sent out ahead of time, but we will be sending the presentation out uh, to all of you, and it will go out in the uh, next 24 hours. Uh, so Andrew will take care of that coming up here. So, biofilms. Now, there's all sorts of information about uh, biofilms out in the world. If you uh, have a background in looking at biofilms, what you probably have run into is that biofilms are, are reasonably well-known and well-studied in things like oceanography uh, and in plant science and things of that nature. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is put together some information that sort of merges what we know about uh, the biofilms from outside of humans to inside of humans. And then, more importantly, I think well, the reason I wanted to update this is some of the therapies are becoming a little bit better known. And I, it, what I run into as I go out and I teach and I talk to people is that the, uh, that the therapy of biofilms is kind of muddled in our minds, and that's just largely because that's the way we've been taught it. So there's a little bit of, uh, it's not really unclarity, it's just sort of uh, misplaced clarity. There's some 
information here on the coming few slides from Dr. Stephen Fry. Now, Stephen Fry uh, is, uh, as it says, an MD. He owns Fry Labs in Arizona, and he actually has some of the best and most uh, cohesive information on biofilms that I've seen. He also, of course, does lab testing that uh, looks for the presence of biofilm, etc. cetera. Uh, and he has a lot of very interesting sorts of uh, uh, laboratory assays and assessments. So we'll talk about testing coming up, but that's who he is. And again, I have no financial connection with him or his lab. I just find his information uh, in informative. So I thought I would put that in here. Uh, so this is, again, I'm not going to read the slides to you, but this is a summary. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what he's saying is, is that in nature, as I was saying, biofilms are, are the rule rather than the exception. This is a way that communities of uh, microorganisms get together and protect themselves. So the first thing is, is that um, this is usually done in areas where there's endogenous moisture. Uh, and so in, in a human or an animal, uh, likewise, it's going to be in areas where you can have uh, not only the substrate structure and the bacteria and the viral, et cetera, structure, but also that you have uh, what you need to grow the biofilm. So that's going to be places like the uh, digestive tract, the respiratory tract, inside the blood vessels, et cetera. Uh, so he has a number of... Uh, there's a number of slides here that I have borrowed from Dr. Fry just to give you some really, uh, what I believe to be some of the best background. So kind of like when you're learning about microbes in general, there's a, there's a, a process and stages that go through. There's attachment. So initial attachment is early attachment. And this actually can be disrupted. And that's an important thing to remember. Because in a little while, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the uh, difference between phase one biofilm assessment and treatment, uh, and then phase two treatment, and when can we go from you know phase one to two or two to one and backwards. So we all have biofilms in us; it's a natural part of life. But the problem that occurs is when we have um, a lot of infections that are chronic and what we might consider to be either subclinical or preclinical, or they're just hiding really well and we don't get immune signs and symptoms from them. When we go through and we have a biofilm form around those uh, seemingly bad infections, chronic infections, they go through these processes and we often, of course, don't know about it. So we've got initial attachment, then we have irreversible attachment. That's sort of the dividing line between can it... Uh, can it fall off or not? Then there's different phases of maturation uh, and then dispersion uh, because they can metastasize just like cancer does. I want to share some information that looking back the last three, actually four years um, in our clinic where we, we were looking at, okay, what do we know about biofilms? And the, the answer to that first question was, geez, we don't know that much. And then the next thing was, what can we know and who can we look to to learn more about biofilms? And the answer to that turned out to be, Jesus, there's a lot of stuff out there about biofilms, but it's kind of uh, hither and yon and all over the place, and it wasn't really well put together. And I'll talk to you about the genesis of that stuff. Uh, so we did a lot of this work that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, at our clinic at AMSA there in Seattle, Washington. And um, we, we gained the cooperation, uh, mostly willingly, of our patients who had uh, chronic infectious illnesses, especially those patients who were not healing and we had a concern that there was a biofilm component. And uh, so that's what we're going to go through here. So when we're talking about biofilms, one of the things to consider is what we've talked about. You've got attachment, they build the biofilm, then the bugs live inside happily and they, they avoid uh, the immune system and they avoid drug treatment by this matrix that protects them. So it's metallominerals and organic molecules. One way you want to think of it is as a superbiotic organism or a superbiotic colony. 
And what that really means is that rather than now dealing with, uh, say, Epstein-Barr virus or mycoplasma or C. pneumo or whatever, strep, what we're dealing with now is potentially a hive or a superbiotic colony inside the biofilm that may encompass virus, bacteria, parasites, fungus, etc., all in the same thing. And something that uh, I, I learned from a biofilm researcher as I was doing the background for this, and this is a biofilm researcher's, researcher who's heavily involved in uh, human biofilm research, uh, they were saying, you know, the way you have to think of this now is you're no longer looking at and dealing with the original organism only. You're dealing with them as a group. And so if you have a group of two or three bacteria or two bacteria and two viruses and, you know, one fungus all living together, what they do biologically and the kind of cytokines they put out and the kind of reaction the immune system has is very different than an acute infection with one of these organisms. So a lot of this information is going to kind of inform some of our previous and some of our future uh, webinars and web calls where we're discussing these chronic infectious agents. It really, uh, what I've seen as we've looked at cause and effect with people who have uh, biofilms and we go and we assault the biofilm and treat them, is that this changes the game with a lot of the chronic illness. Um, basically, biofilms can form anywhere where water is present, like I mentioned earlier. So that would be blood vessels, respiratory, GI tract, etc. And uh, teeth, so the first place where they were really uh, delineated as biofilms was really in dentistry, and they're, they're quite well known in dentistry. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is, is that the, the biofilm matrix, so that metallo-mineral and organic molecule matrix is able to protect against antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, but also probably most importantly, it is potentially able to protect against your own immune system. So who has biofilms? Everybody has biofilms. And so whenever everybody has something, it's easy to say, well, then is it really clinically significant? And I think that's the clinical determination we need to make, which is everybody has them. But if they're at those earlier stages and or we don't have a lot of pathogenic bugs living in them, they're probably not terribly clinically relevant. The place where I see biofilm work fitting in and where I've seen it fit in clinically with patients is really in the unresolving cases, the people with multiple chronic infections, or people with infections, this is the number two one says, They've got these positive lab titers, and the lab titer will not clear no matter what. Um, and so we see this with uh, standard of care treatments. You see this a lot with H. pylori, for example. You get somebody with H. pylori IgA that's persistently elevated, meaning that the mucous membranes are constantly in a fight with H. pylori. Uh, a lot of that can be biofilm, especially if they've been treated and treated and treated. And you'll see some strategies coming up for that. The other one uh, that's very common is uh, the ASO people. So you got an elevated anti-streptolysin O titer, and uh, you're having a great deal of difficulty getting it to come down. For those who have listened to some of my chronic illness infection stuff, you know, I'll often say the ASO is usually the last thing to go away in a chronically ill person. A lot of that is because they're the ASO producing streptococcal organisms. Uh, Many, many of them live in the GI tract, and many of them are protected by uh, biofilms. Uh, another that would be a clinical tell would be people who clear one infection only to get another or another group of infections. We certainly all have those patients. Uh, people with chronic GI infections and really all of the chronically ill. So biofilms are really, they're, they're very similar to the logic that we used to talk about our uh, chronically ill people with what we term as opportunistic problems. So opportunistic infections are those things like, you know, Epstein-Barr, it affects some people in just an acute way, but other people it keeps coming back, you know, C-pneumo and mycoplasmas and 
all of those other ones, they, they, they're opportunistic in the sense that the sicker we are, the worse they are. And what we're finding is the more that we assess and treat and reassess around biofilms, the more headway we make with those chronically ill patients. So again, as I said, I don't have any connection to Fry Labs, but if we do need a biofilm assay run, that's usually who we use is Fry Labs. You can get information from them. Uh, <coughs> but what I have sort of gravitated to or devolved to or whatever you want to call it is I don't run these biofilm tests on lots of people unless they really, really just want to know because they're all going to be positive anyway um, in, in all your chronically ill people. Now, what I, what I will say is I have not done a ton of testing in healthy people uh, for biofilms, and so I really don't have a comparison there because it would be, uh, in my mind, it would be pointless to be you know, testing healthy people unless you had a high index of suspicion there was something real cold going on. So normally I don't run these tests unless the person really, really wants to do it. I will just look uh, at their history and I'll say, we've, you know, we've been on this round robin of treating, you know, you've had uh, Borrelia treated and you've had FC bar treated and Candida and 11 other things. And, you know, they keep popping their heads back up, probably biofilms. This is one of the big changes from the last time that I presented about biofilms online. And I presented this live three or four times since then, which is kind of what prompted me that and people asking uh, to do this particular uh, web call over again on biofilms. There's two phases in the spectrum of biofilm. So the first um, is quorum sensing and attachment. Now remember that there's the early stage in Dr. Fry's notes back there talking about uh, a, an attachment that can be reversed and then you have irreversible attachment. So attachment and quorum sensing are in a, uh, in, in a spectrum. So what happens in quorum sensing is that the, the organism has inductive cell signaling, you get expression of virulence genes and drug resistant genes and all of that stuff, and then you wind up with attachment or initial attachment of the colony because that's part of its, uh, its, its resistance, its pathogenic nature. So even if you go back to like general um, bio, uh, microbiology, remember that one of the things that makes a microbe much more pathogenic is having some gambit or gambits around uh, the normal immune surveillance that would kick it out of the body. And so these things like the quorum sensing and attachment, the stronger these are, the faster the biofilm builds. So in prevention, the reason it says inhibit on the first three things there is in phase one, if you can do things that slow down these pathogenic inducers like quorum sensing things, uh, virulence and resistant genes, et cetera, if you can inhibit attachment um, and if you can uh, get their other biologic uh, uh, drug resistance activities to slow down, like it says here, reflux pumps and multi-resistant drug pumps. Um, if you can inhibit those or slow them down, you're going to have less bugs. You're going to have potentially less genomic expression of their virulence, and you're going to have less attachment. What's interesting is, is that a lot of the things that are inhibitory in the preventive stage are things that either should be going on in your body, such as the appropriate production of acids and enzymes, that's a big deal, and or the uh, things that are normally added to foods in traditional diets, aromatic herbs and spices and all of that. All of those are preventive in phase one or the essentially attachment virulence stage of a biofilm. When you get beyond phase one, however, then you need some kind of active therapy. 
And we're going to go through this a couple of times, but when you're in active therapy, the things that normally would work for prevention are going to be much weaker for an active biofilm. And we're going to look at that. That's really kind of the, the hub around which we, we're going to uh, build such things. So you want to see biofilm uh, prescription treatment uh, and uh, uh, in genesis as a, uh, as a spectrum. So when we're looking here, in phase one, we're going to be working on things that the body can do. Uh, if that's possible, we're going to be working on, you know, immune surveillance like NK cell function. We're going to be working in the gut on acid production and enzyme production. In phase one, you can add acid and add enzymes. That will cut down on biofilms. Uh, and then, as I said, aromatic herbs and things of that nature are very, very powerful in phase one. And then later in phase two, what we have to do is we have to do all that stuff in one way or another in phase one. And we have to add things that actually assault the biofilm. Because just like any other pathogenic thing in a sick person, the longer the biofilm has been, you know, given time to set up shop inside the blood vessels or inside the, uh, the gut or the lungs or wherever, uh, the more pathogenic it is. So down here where it's talking about biofilm prescription and its comparisons, we'll bring that up in a little bit. We're going to talk about agents that come up. Um, and this is, I think, the thing that we've learned the most, both with my discussing biofilm research with some uh, big-time human biofilm researchers uh, where they're doing studies into uh, biofilm biology and treatment of biofilms, and also what we've seen in our own patient population, some of the sicker people. These are going to come up uh, as, uh, as what I would consider new axioms and that is you, you can't treat somebody who's got a phase two biofilm that's really well set, uh, which with phase one therapies alone. Phase one therapies are important and we're gonna go through those, but you can't, uh, you can't uh, pull all the weight of a phase two biofilm patient with phase one therapies. And I think that that's something that, um, that we've all been a little bit confused about. So um, one of the things that uh, I'll just, uh, bring up here as we move forward and we go into, you know, prevention uh, and uh, treatment in phase one and phase two is, uh, and th this is, you know, neither here nor there as far as why it comes about, but you all have seen this happen in multiple areas of medicine. Most of the biofilm uh, information that we have in the past has been uh, less of around research and uh, actual intervention into does it work and all that stuff. And it's more focused biofilm information that have been given to doctors has more focused on the, uh, the availability of certain supplements and other things that are used to so-called treat biofilms. And so the information that's passed along when you're looking at it from the point of view of this is treatment X and treatment X is supposedly good for biofilms and so we will buy treatment X and give it to our patients. Um, that might be true, but it's taken sometimes or many times out of context, meaning most of the treatments that we've been taught about have been phase one treatments and they're great but most of our sicker patients have a broader and deeper uh, experience of biofilms and those phase one products don't work. So what are some of the phase one products? Well, these are things like enzyme-based uh, products. These are high-dose enzyme products, lumbrokinase, stuff like that. Uh, aromatics, uh, things like oregano, uh, olive leaf, you know, stuff of that nature. All of these are really good, they're just sufficient in the beginning and preventive in the early stages and then in the cleanup stage later, but they're not sufficient with your chronically ill folks because none of these things here really break through uh, the deeper biofilms. Uh, tannins, phenolics, xylitol and stevia even are things that have been researched and do work. Uh, black cumin. Black cumin is, uh, there, there's just a couple of companies that make it as a, as a supplement. 
uh, but black cumin, kind of like xylitol or stevia, uh, can get in and, and disrupt and assault uh, the biofilms. Now, what I've seen uh, over time is these things all kind of have relative weights. So I remember um, going on almost a year ago, I was discussing this and in a conference, and somebody said, you know, they were trying to just pick one thing that would work all the time for biofilms. Um, and so they said, well, what about xylitol, or what about, you know, lumbokinase, or what about whatever? Um, and the, the point of the discussion we had was they're all good, but they all uh, assault the biofilm in a particular way. And once the biofilm gets built bigger and thicker and stronger, most of those things don't do anything for it. So you have to actually open and uh, break down the biofilm for these things to work if the biofilm has been there any amount of time. Now the other thing, just so you have the background, is there's there's a great deal of biofilm uh, research in medicine going on, but most of it is not talked about. Uh, most of it is funded uh, by the um, by the military and, and by other people who are in, you know involved in uh, things such as uh, uh, chronic infections and avoiding chronic infections. And so there's a lot of research in where they've done head-to-head trials with different types of biofilm agents and, and and what we see that comes out of it and what I've seen in the patients we've done these interventions with is all these things on this page of as far as phase one you know prevention or treatment in the early phases is great um, and, and I think I just saw a question flash up so I'll, I'll open up that tag in just a second um, but when you're looking at trying to apply these things to a later stage biofilm, uh, they essentially will just bounce off. All right. Let's see, I did something in my, my screen here. Hold on. All right, so this is just some of the uh, things that have been looked at as far as, you know, as, far as things like xylitol. Uh, here's, I think, uh, one of the stevia studies that went on. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's uh, a number of different ways in. Now, the way I usually talk about it with patients is, is if you're not chronically ill, and you're looking at prevention or you're looking at, geez, you know, I've, I've been relatively uh, uh, healthy, um, but I, I've been sick for the last six months or something. These phase one treatments are probably just the thing for you. Um, and I think that um, what you see is um, anything that can help as I was saying earlier, nature sort of builds this into the way that our, our the most common place that these start is the digestive tract. So acidification is a part of, of, of weakening biofilm formation. Enzyme production is a part of uh, uh, weakening biofilm uh, formation, et cetera. So there's, there's all sorts of ways that nature does this. Um, so I think, yeah, here, sorry, I was having a little trouble with opening stuff up. Uh, give example of phenolics. So, uh, so phenolics, there's obviously a chemical, um, chemical distinction, but basically uh, phenolics in the sense that they're talked about here would, in, would include any of the uh, plant flavonoids and the uh, polyphenol compounds found in most, mostly uh, plant flavonoids. Here, here is a related example of like black cumin, which is probably one of the most potent plant uh, biofilm agents, at least as far as uh, breaking into the outside hive, uh, so to speak, of the biofilm. And this is another thing that's on the horizon. Uh, this, this is 
research I think just came out just a little bit uh, like three four months ago maybe a little bit more um, and this is actually using uh, microbes that grow in marine environments where biofilms are ubiquitous that have anti-biofilm activity probably through quorum sensing and other stuff that we talked about to actually create a biofilm drug so w what I'm trying to show here is there's there's a lot of research going into biofilm uh, treatment in the world of medicine. It's, biofilms are considered to be one of the biggest threats to human health by uh, people you know, at uh, the FDA and people at you know, big places like that. They just don't really want people uh, worrying about it or talking about it, as is usually the case. So once you break over into a later stage biofilm. The way that you want to think about it um, and the way that it was put to me by, by the biofilm researchers I met with is that uh, the phase one treatments like heavy enzyme doses and acids and uh, phenolics and tannins and all of these goodies that we use all the time um, get more and more and more ineffective against the biofilm. And the reason for that is that the biofilm, remember, is on a spectrum in its growth. It's on a spectrum in the number of bugs that get inside of it. And so the longer it's been there, the tougher it gets. <clears throat> and not only does it get tougher, but it also allows multiple infectious agents to grow within it. Remember, we said they become a new organism. So they work together, and they create a different cytokine spectrum that they put out in all sorts of other things. And so when we get to phase two, there are things that we need from phase one, and then there's the concept of disruption. So in phase one, you can disrupt with acids and enzymes, you can disrupt with uh, phenolic compounds, you can disrupt with uh, aromatic compounds, et cetera. In phase two, you kind of need a, at least a one, two, if not a one, two, three punch of uh, all of the stuff that kind of gets after the biofilm and then you need a true disruptor and I think that that's the biggest dividing line between phase one and two is the need for a, an actual disruptive agent and what we find is is that things such as enzymes and things such as aromatics and the more common stuff that we use aren't really good disruptors and uh, that's the thing that the more modern biofilm uh, research is sort of bringing out and when you look at what people are doing in hospital medicine around biofilms and, and infectious disease around biofilms. They're aimed at these phase two biofilms, which are really what are in common with most of our chronically ill patients. So in phase two, we're gonna think about antimicrobial uh, therapies, things like, you know, things like black cumin and things like oregano and things like all this other stuff that we use, plus probably synthetic antimicrobials because at that point the mass of infectious material in the biofilm is a force to be reckoned with, and then we need something to open up the biofilm. So that's the things we wanna talk about. Now, these are some global things. So what I wanna do is kinda of go from the global as far as phase two uh, biofilm disruptors, and that's mostly what's on this page here. And then I want to move towards the more specific things that we're seeing not only uh, in research showing that they're the way to go, but from my uh, experience in taking patients who've been on every other biofilm therapy known to humanity and then putting them on something that's a little bit more specific and seeing their entire case change, this has been quite a revelation for our patients with, with chronic infections. And so remember, the sicker your patient is, the longer they're sick, the more you're gonna think about going uh, down the spectrum, get into phase two therapies, and I'm gonna show you how to make them more specific. And then once the case opens up and the biofilms are softened up, then you can go back to phase one therapies. And that's gonna work a lot better in my experience and in the experience of people who actually do a lot of research on this. So this is a big picture things. Uh, bismuth has been used for a long time, EDTA. EDTA is probably one of the oldest researched uh, items for um, biofilm disruption. Actually, silver nanoparticles have some research into them. One of the reasons probably why silver nanotherapy, so not, not colloidal silvers, but 
like uh, nano silvers, you know, 23 part per million silvers. One of the reasons that they probably work the way they do and why people sometimes get uh, cytokine reactions to those is probably from the biofilm effect and less about the silver itself. Then there's uh, the direct anti-infectives, peroxide, high-dose vitamin C, germanium, zinc, um, oral anti-infectives, whether they be from the plant kingdom or the drug kingdom. Uh, thiol, so mono and dithiols are in, uh, important, and then bismuthiol complexes, which we're going to talk about kind of at the end. Um, so EDTA, EDTA is a very useful substance to use with biofilms. Um, normally in our clinic when we're doing stuff, it's calcium disodium EDTA, often just called calcium EDTA. There is disodium EDTA, which we use occasionally with some treatments, some clinics use. EDTA on its own is known, and there's some references down below, um, EDTA on its own is known as a reasonable biofilm disruptor. Now what I found with EDTA is, is that um, it has, it's kind of like nano silver um, and uh, thiols on their own. They all have a way to the biofilm and they all have a way of like irritating the biofilm. But they tend to not stick and not work terribly deeply. So if you're looking at a spectrum and you're looking at high dose enzymes and acids and uh, phenolics, you know, and aromatics. They're going to be kind of on the left-hand side as, as far as the biofilm itself. I'm not talking about the buzz. Things like EDTA and silver and thiols on their own and bismuth on its own are going to be kind of in the middle. And then the combination products that are a little bit more tenacious are going to be on the right-hand side. And they're all appropriate, but they're appropriate at different times in the treatment. If you do have a clinic where you do EDTA intravenously, just, just do, a, do a, a formula that meets the criteria for intravenous EDTA, and um, you can be just fine with it. That will be helpful. Now, I say here um, you can also uh, give your anti-infective therapy and then follow it up with EDTA as a therapy, or you can do low-dose EDTA. All of that's appropriate. Um, you do want to remember if you're giving EDTA intravenously, uh, you don't want to give iron, zinc, or copper on the same day because it will the EDTA is floating around in the plasma and it will bind to those ions in the plasma. Other than that, in a lot of patients in the induction phase, if they have very bad infections, we'll give them intravenous anti-infective substances, whether it's a drug or a natural thing or whatever, and we will actually, if it's compatible, put the EDTA in with the drug or in with the natural agent or give it right afterwards. And it is one way in. And as I said, EDTA is kind of in the middle. Uh, so it's, it's, a good, it's a good starting place as a uh, kind of the beginning to phase two therapies. Other people have asked me, can I just run my regular EDTA chelation protocol, then do IV antibiotic or immune therapy or whatever? And the bottom line is, yeah. There's, there are people who theorize that one of the biggest benefits of EDTA chelation therapy is that it disrupts the biofilms in the blood vessels, which are a real phenomenon or a very big problem. Um, and it actually sort of continuously assaults the biofilm in the vasculature. And, and that's one of the reasons it does more of, uh, uh, more of what it does than maybe the actual chelation portion. You also can use like a 23 part per million hydrosol of silver. That's what I use. Um, I don't use high-dose colloids unless it's like a topical or something like that. Um, the thing you have to remember is if you're mixing these therapies, um, you don't want to give them on the same day as a chelator like DMPS or EDTA or DMSA because the silver is highly attractive to the chelator. So if you're mixing and matching, just don't put these together with a, with a chelating substance. And... Um, what you see with silver, the, the nano silvers, et cetera, the, and there's the research that's listed kind of shows this, is they're probably, as I said, in the middle to the low middle. So they're sort of on the prevention early phase two treatment side. So it's something to consider if that's part of what you do. 
what I've seen is if, if, if you're doing this already and you're not seeing a whole lot of traction with your infected patient, then you probably want to move up the intensity a little bit. Now, bismuth is an old treatment for biofilms even before we knew it was treating biofilms. And this is partly why in H. pylori treatments you see bismuth used, et cetera. I just want to make this point right here in the middle that you never use intravenous bismuth. Um, stick with oral bismuth if you're going to use it. And I don't use a lot of bismuth on its own anymore. We usually have it complex, but <clears throat> it's, it's fairly safe to use orally. Um, there was a doctor who thought, well, I'll give IV bismuth to people, um, and he did, and he killed a patient. He harmed a bunch of other people. So even if you can get IV bismuth, do not give that to people. That's just, that's just a bad idea. Then there's the thiols, and most of us have heard people say, well, I, I'm careful with my chronically ill patients and giving them like uh, NAC or something because I'm worried about breaking up the biofilms in their GI tract, et cetera. If you've been around for a while, you've probably heard that. Um, and, and that's true. <clears throat> um, remember that the diethyls usually start with D, so DMPS and DMSA. Those We think of them as chelators because they are, so they have those two sulfhydryl arms that grab onto metals. Well, they also uh, will get into and, and assault the biofilm. Now, why do we see things like either ions or chelators uh, bothering a biofilm? Well, the reason probably is if you go back to one of the early slides, remember that there a biofilm is like a hive that is constructive of organic materials and then metalloids and the metalloids stick to the organics and vice versa and they build this sort of a web structure. So it would make a lot of sense that thiols, which all of the thiols, mono and diethyls, uh, have uh, attraction and chelating ability uh, into metalloids. It makes sense that these things would be hard on the biofilm and indeed the MPS, DMSA, ALA, NAC, and even glutathione are useful in biofilm therapy. Again, th there are some patients who probably get as much uh, effect out of glutathione, you know, like intravenous glutathione or liposomal oral glutathione uh, on the biofilm end as they do from almost anything else. Another uh, thing to consider uh, conceptually is to stack things. So. Um, when you get into phase two, what, what we were looking at and what you know, the human researchers were telling me and then what we tried with our patients was once you get to phase two, it's not enough just to beat the biofilm up. You have to beat the biofilm up and then it's sort of like uh, you know, kicking a beehive. You have to make sure there's enough stuff around to deal with the onslaught of immune activity that comes out. I'm going to talk about that more. Uh, coming up here. We'll talk about bismuthyl complexes, high dose enzymes, and all that stuff. And it's just a matter of timing what's best at the time. So, things that you can do um, if you're going to use things like EDTA, uh, bismuthyl complexes, I say, well, I'm going to table that for a second because we'll talk about it later. Um, if you're using EDTA, you can actually use EDTA uh, at a low dose in with antibiotics or high dose vitamin C. That's one way to get the anti infective uh, immune support and uh, biofilm all together. If you're doing a disodium EDTA, you do lower doses. Um, and you also can uh, use oral EDTA because we're going to talk about this, but the kind of ground zero for biofilms is in the gut then either the respiratory system and or the vascular system. So the gut's kind of where it all starts. So oral treatments really have a big place in biofilm therapy. And then remember what I said is if you're doing EDTA, you want to do stuff like the 23 part per million silver uh, orally, you know, a tablespoon four times a day. Um, that will also at least aggravate early biofilms. If you're going to use a diethyl, uh, DMSA 3 to 500 uh, away from food, DMPS 25 to 50 milligrams, uh, usually we give that 
right after an anti-infective in an IV setting. Let's see, let me open this screen up better this time, Laura. Uh, recipe and brand for business aisle complex, that's coming right up. Uh, the black cumin. Okay, so the black cumin, um, there's only two companies that make it, and they're kind of oddball, to me they were oddball companies, but if you, if you do a search for black cumin, I think they're black cumin gel caps, um, it's pretty potent stuff, and both, kind. I think they're made by the same people. Um, and when you're using black cumin, um, I dose it similarly to the way that I dose like ADP, you know, oregano, Mexican oregano complex, where I start with one, two or three times a day right before eating. If that's tolerated, then I'll go up to two uh, of the black cumins, you know, three times a day before food, um, and then wait for the response or look for the response. I will say that from what I've seen, the black cumin is, it's again, kind of like the silver. It's sort of in the middle. It's between phase one and phase two. The 23 part per million silver the, um, is two names. Uh, Argentin is one, and then uh, Sovereign Silver is the other one. They're basically the same thing. Uh, and then we'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll actually show you the recipe for the, the other one. So ALA and NAC and glutathione are higher doses, as you can see. Um, and, and just something to keep in mind, if you have somebody who's, uh, we had this once with a patient that had a whole bunch of GI biofilm. We didn't realize that that was part of their problem. And we gave them a, a BMSA challenge, you know, an oral BMSA, you know, chelator challenge. And uh, they wound up having diarrhea for like two or three weeks afterwards. A lot of gut stuff came on. It turned out that, that what we really did was we didn't really chelate them as much as what we did was really angered the GI uh, microbiome that was hiding inside of the biofilm that decided to come out. So if you've had people with history of reacting very weirdly to ALA, NAC, you know, any of these other things, especially orally, um, consider that maybe there's some GI biofilms kind of residing there. So again, keep in mind, you know, on the left-hand side, we're going to have preventive stuff like good digestive function, lots of uh, spices in your food, uh, natural, you know, increases in enzymes and acid, and then we're going to go to higher doses of enzymes, acid, um, aromatics and phenolics and all of that business. And then in the middle, you know, we have the heavier stuff like oregano and black cumin and maybe silver would fit in here, et cetera. And then the deeper the, you get into the biofilm, the more you're going to be uh, looking at things that actually kind of stick to it. So here you see chelators and complexes going on. So I just want to address a couple things before I get into using bismuth as a therapy. Um, is, isn't bismuth toxic? So not in the form where it's bound. Um, so when you look at bismuth and thiol together, um, they're no longer either bismuth nor thiol. They're sort of a new compound, and it's the new molecule or the new compound that actually disrupts the biofilm. So the distinction I want to make is that bismuth on its own can be toxic. So if you're just using super high doses of bismuth, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you have to pulse it. You have to be careful about it building up, et cetera. What the uh, military researchers have found is that if you combine the bismuth and the thiol together, and I'll show you how to do that, um, you, you get a new molecule that is stable and does not release either the thiol or the bismuth from the molecule. So we'll talk about that. Uh, won't the thiol chelate my patient? No. Um, if you're using the recipe I'm going to show you, there's a dithiol, which normally would be chelated, but the thing that's keeping the bismuth non-toxic is the fact that the dithiol is stuck to it, and this actually works in the monothiol version as well. So the bismuth toxicity is mitigated, and the thiol chelating uh, ability is muted, so it becomes sort of a, a different type of a mechanism. 
And the next thing is the if I see um, an immune response when I start a biofilm agent, does it mean it's not working? No. In fact, what, what we coach our patients now to do is we're, we say we're going to start, okay, it looks like, you know, you didn't get too far with the other therapies we tried or people have been treating you for chronic this, that, or the other thing for, you know, three years trying to kill these bugs or 20 years trying to kill these bugs. You've got biofilms. They're, they're built up. It's, a, it's part of nature. Um, I'm going to give you stuff to go in and assault the biofilm, but as your um, body starts to feel the biofilm open up and the immune system starts to see all these bugs that were previously kind of hidden, you're going to have probably some kind of immune response, and I'll give them a spectrum, you know, and say your, your body communicates by cytokines, and so cytokine response could be all in your gut, you know, the lady that got the diarrhea. It could be achiness. Uh, it could be, especially in pans and pandas, you'll see, you know, aggravation of the mental symptoms. So as soon as we see that, we're going to, we have a, 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 a procedure for dealing with it. But what that means is you need to let me know this is starting so that we can increase the intensity on killing the bugs and supporting your body at the same time. So we've looked, or we've talked about, you know, bismuth on its own, thiols on their own, chelators on their own, silver, etc. Just keep in mind that bismuth thiol together is more in the sum of its parts. Um, and it has its own pharmacology. So it's not the pharmacology of bismuth. It's not the pharmacology of DMSA or DMPS. It's the pharmacology of, of the family when they're together. Um, I think we've been over this. Um, something just to consider as we go through here. Um, we've actually taken patients who we thought, well, when we give them an intravenous uh, biofilm treatment, so we give them a, you know, let's say what I would consider kind of the top of the heap as far as the IV biofilm treatment, because obviously you can only use certain things, IV. We give them an antibiotic IV. We give them an immune-stimulating IV with EDTA in it, and then we give them a little DMPS at the end. So they've got a thiol, uh, diethyl, actually. They've got EDTA. They've got an antibiotic. They've got immune stimulant. They'll have some reactions to that. But, but what it's saying here is we've actually seen much more and much more intense uh, immunologic reactions with orally administered phase two biofilm agents. I mean, by orders of magnitude higher. And I think it's because the biofilms, as we believe to understand them now, start in the gut and work their way out into the body. And so a systemic treatment like through intravenous is gonna be good and it's gonna more directly access the vascular component and possibly the respiratory component but the gut, because it's ground zero, you'll actually get a lot more intensity of reaction. So just very quickly, this is, uh, this is my uh, uh, exaggeration of free bismuth. So uh, oh, I think I have two there. Let me just pause and read them here. Um, do oral phase two biofilm disruptors only work on GI biofilms or they will, will they work elsewhere? Um, based on the research that we have now, if we're talking uh, especially about the complex things like thiols and bismuth stuck together, uh, the research would say that uh, they hit the GI tract first and very hard and that they actually do <clears throat> absorb and work systemically. So viewer number nine, uh, the oral ones, kind of like a lot of oral things, they hit the gut fairly hard, and then over time they work their way into the system. So oral does work systemically. Um, and Laura, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come right up to the answer to that question as well. So I will be right there. So this is free bismuth, and you can certainly use bismuth as long as you don't use it and use it too long and all that, because it is... Uh, it is toxic, but it also can be chelated if you, you were to get toxic with it. 
but this is kind of the way to think about it. There's a metalloattractive portion and a toxic base portion. The thiols kind of have the same thing. There's a stable and a chelating portion as well. And so free thiols and free bismuth all have their own ways into irritating a biofilm. This is the bismuth in the middle of two different kinds of thiols. And so this is the molecule uh, that I'm going to show you that uh, that mimics what the government created and they use in the military and all that stuff. Uh, and the bottom line of it is is that the reactive portions of the bismuth and the thiol are tied together so that what you have is uh, literally uh, a, a, a chemically built new molecule that has, um, and the reason I use the triangle is it has a wedge-like structure and effect to it uh, that uh, can actually get into the biofilm as illustrated by the red chevrons there with the bugs on the inside of it. And this is what you have to warn your patients about, and that is that they will suddenly have the immune system, quote unquote, seeing the bugs. And what, what it means to see the bugs is, oh, now uh, they know they've been sick. They know they've been chronically ill. They've had 13 rounds of antibiotics and antifungals, and they've been given the IV, this, that, and the other thing, and it all, quote unquote, quit working. What's going to happen is, is that as soon as you start to beat up on the biofilm, the immune system is going to say, oh, look at all of these bugs that are here. Uh, we didn't see these before. And so you're going to start to have immune activity. And so, uh, Laura, to your point, which I'm coming to, we have to warn the patient about this, and we have to also be ready for it. Uh, and there, in, in my experience, there's been a few areas where this turns out to be the case. But... Um, Obviously, it doesn't look exactly like these funny shapes that I made here in PowerPoint, but the idea that you need to have and you need to show your patient is as we give these agents to get in and, and uh, sort of worm their way and wedge their way into the biofilm, the anti-infective substances have to be there to move in and start to beat the bugs up, and then we may need other things to calm down the response in the rest of the body. Because if you, you know, if you really, it's kind of like kicking the beehive and two bees come out versus kicking a beehive and, you know, a thousand bees come out, you have a whole different level of uh, activity that goes on that your body is going to see. <clears throat> so there's this formula here. And here's the, if you go down to the second bullet point that says formula, this is the uh, exact recipe, and as long as you, any, any compounding pharmacy can make this, the one part that we've had uh, issue getting compound pharmacies to do is to get bismuth subnitrate. And so you say, well, what's the difference between bismuth subnitrate and bismuth citrate and bismuth salicylate? <clears throat> well, just like other things that are chelated and have a second word to them, um, the subnitrate versus the citrate versus uh, the, the salicylate versus all the other forms have different binding affinities. So the formula here using DMPS and ALA as the thiols, you have a monothiol and a dithiol, so they're going to be on the outside corners and then the bismuth subnitrate. The reason for this is, and there's tons of references at the end if you want to go digging through the pharmacology of it, if you use bismuth subnitrate, you get a much faster and harder binding of the thiol to the bismuth, and you create that literal safe wedge molecule. If you use a weaker, uh, a weaker form of bismuth, like citrate or, or salicylate, it's going to bind much more slowly. Now, if that's all you can get, that's fine. It's just in this formula, they combine these at the pharmacy they mix them together, and while they are being mixed, the thiol stick to the bismuth, so it becomes that new thing. One of the things we did early on was give people uh, bismuth capsules, and then uh, and then uh, you know ALA or DMPS had them take them at the same time and hope that they mix in their stomach. Now you can do that, and it, it, it still works, but it does not work nearly as well as this stuff does. Uh, I know the reason I'm mentioning Impermus, they're in uh, Southern California, 
um, is that uh, I got them to order enough bismuth subnitrate to make this stuff. You can send this recipe to any other uh, pharmacy in the world and they can make it. Uh, the Canadian uh, doctors, we sent it up to some of their compounders and they were able to make it as well. Ideally, no substitutions. If DMPS is unavailable, you can use DMSA at a different dose. And if you have to, you can use subcitrate of bismuth versus subnitrate, but you're really better off with subnitrate. So if you look at the pharmacology data that the references in the, at the end uh, speak to, there's an order of the thiol uh, potency and the bismuth potency, and they have them listed as to what are the most uh, reactive thiols and most reactive bismuth forms. And they go down the list from like most reactive to least reactive. The subnitrate form of bismuth and then DMPS and ALA together are going to be the most strong prescription items that you can get in North America. The super strong ones are being sequestered to be turned into a trade drug and they are unavailable for purchase by any compounding or other pharmacy. Uh, so the point of this is uh, pharma is coming out with a similar thing to this that uh, is going to be a biofilm therapy that will be used by infectious disease doctors. And it's basically going to be the same thing, only different versions of the bismuth and the thiol. And again, I don't make any money from this. I'm just telling you what it is. So this is the SIG. Um, the test dose, I usually do one cap a day away from food. It's important if you can to do it away from food. I tell them away from food with a full glass of water once a day, three times a week, so three or four times a week. Most people don't respond or don't react badly to that single capsule test dose the first week, but it's always good because you never know, you know, how much, you know, you're going to kick a beehive uh, to start low and work up. Now it says here one to four caps. Uh, daily to, to twice a day away from fruit three to five times a week. So that's kind of a wide range. What I do with most patients is tell them, let's try this. If one a day for three days the first week is no problem at all, then I want you to go to two or three or four based on their body size. So, you know, at a 90-pound person, I might go to two as a big dose. 150-pound person, I might go to three. 250 pound person, I might go to four, and I'm going to do it probably four or five days a week. Uh, again, full glass water away from food and other pills. Reason being is that you get a lot better uh, and more clear clinical effect from this. Now, if they have a flare up, like uh, their skin flares up, they get a, a cytokine flare or something like that because you kicked a big beehive versus a little one, you can try some extra doses on the off days. And that can be helpful sometimes. Most important thing is the last bullet point is, and I tell them this, if you start to get any of your old symptoms, for instance, we had a, a, a PANS Panda uh, case where, you know, things had kind of quote unquote settled down, but there's still a lot of infectious activity. And we just warned them. We said, if you start noticing anything, you know, if your depression or anxiety gets worse or any of this stuff, you know, let us know and I'll show you what we did there. But that's the biggest thing. If, you're, if your joints start to hurt and they weren't hurting, if you start to get skin eruptions or red skin or inflamed skin, get inflamed anywhere, that means that the cytokines are starting to build up and flow. And uh, we need to, to add in other treatments. And those are basically going to be two things. One is going to be anti-infectives. So we're going to kick up the anti-infectives. The other is going to be endocrine because your endocrine system gets overwhelmed by all of those cytokines when you start to stir the pot. So normally it says 60 to 120 days. <clears throat> Usual trajectory is in the first 30 to 60 days is where we're just getting it, the dose into them. Most of the patients where, you know, they're under 50 and they've been sick for five to 10 years, let's say, they start to notice within the first 30 to 45 days that they start to get these cytokine reactions, which means, okay, the biofilms are opening up. We need more anti-infective and we need more uh, of the endocrine uh, support. 
some people who are really resistant might be 60 to 90 days before they start to notice. Uh, and then once you start to have the reaction and the biofilm is breaking open and all that business, uh, that's when you have to do this balancing act. And the bottom line is, is that you, you have to allow the immune reaction, you have to get the anti-infective -inf therapies in there, but you have to consider the patient's comfort. Because this is sort of like a, a, you know, the old uh, idea of a healing crisis or healing reaction that turns into just a plain old crisis. Um, if you have people that can't move their joints because they're having that much cytokine activity, or you have a PAMS case where, you know, their anxiety is so bad they won't leave their room, or, <clears throat> you know, you have people get depressed or people get, you know, other inflammatory things, you don't want to totally suppress the inflammation, but you got to make it get comfortable. So what I have found that works the best is increasing the anti-infectives that I'm giving. So let's say they were on kind of a broad-based anti-infective like a, a, you know, Mexican oregano or something like that. And that was kind of working pretty good. You start the biofilm stuff. They start to kind of, you know, mushroom along into a bigger uh, reaction. I may add either more natural anti-infectives or a natural and a, and a prescription anti-infective or two or three, whatever I think that their case needs, depending on my original testing of infections, et cetera. The other is adrenal support and sometimes thyroid support. And this just goes back to the old thing of if the, if the patient is inflamed enough, they will start to tear through their adrenal reserve. And if their adrenal reserve is already low, such as in the case of most of these patients, they will fall off a cliff, which is why they have such bad cytokine and, and healing reactions, so to speak, problems. So if they're on a non-prescription adrenal support, I have seen people need five to 10 times the dose of their adrenal support to calm down their system. Usually if it has to go that high, we move them to you know, add some hydrocortisone or something like that. If they're on low dose hydrocortisone, so you got them on two and a half or five or 10 or 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone, they will need to ramp up the hydrocortisone and their adrenal support until they feel the symptoms calm down and you can keep giving the anti-infectives. Because the literal idea at this point is you've opened up the nest, you've kicked the hive, now the bees are swarming. We have to not only kill the bees, but we have to calm down uh, the venom that has been released, which is your own immune system cytokine activity. So in most cases, if they're not on, you know, hydrocortisone, but they're on adrenal, most of our people are on adrenal support, um, the first thing that I will do, uh, especially if I didn't really think they needed, you know, hydrocortisone, is I'll say, okay, take, you know, your, your adrenal complex, take three times as much and see if that's enough. If in a day or two, that's not enough, then I'll put them on 10, 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone in the morning, and that usually takes care of it. It's non-suppressive, and it allows the immune system to work, but they don't want to die. If they're on adrenal support and they're on hydrocortisone, I will have them double or triple the hydrocortisone and the adrenal support again until things calm down, and then we taper them back down. I do want to throw in just a, um, a plug here, as we all know, when the adrenals get active or faux active, being that you have your um, you know, adrenal support kick up uh, from a pharmacologic point of view, the thyroid takes kind of a big hit. Um, so we want to uh, be mindful of that. And if they're on thyroid, you might have to temporarily adjust the thyroid while you're giving them you know, the steroids to help out, et cetera. So do remember this is, uh, it's, it's kind of linear and nonlinear at the same time. Obviously we don't build the same biofilms everywhere all at the same time. We do seem to notice that the gut is, is the worst place because it's the first place. And then stuff like respiratory and vascular is, is a little bit easier to deal with. But once you get going, and, and let's say you've had like some of the cases we've seen, um, 
the, the lower phase one things maybe made a little difference, but not too much. And we kick it up and we do like bismuthiol and some aromatic herbs and some anti-infective drugs and whatever. And we, you know, things really start moving. Then it's a matter of, okay, how long do we need to do that? And that, as I said, can be, you know, months, you know, three to 12 months in a chronically infected patient. And then as they get what we would call tolerated to the treatment, meaning we can ramp them down off of their hydrocortisone or ramp them on lower dose of hydrocortisone, uh, we can get them on lower doses of thyroid and uh, lower doses of adrenal support and all that business. Um, I take that to mean we've kind of got the biofilm softened up. So that might be a time to go to the left on the spectrum and then start to see if, you know, let's transition them over to some maintenance with uh, black cumin and ADP or whatever oregano I'm going to use and, and some those enzymes or whatever. And then, you know, we'll just kind of keep an eye on it as it goes. What I would say is if, if you have an early case, like we talked about in the beginning of the person who, um, you know, they haven't been sick repeatedly, they're not a chronically ill person, but they've had a really bad three to six months and they're kind of now they're not kicking a GI or respiratory or some other thing, you might be able to completely handle that with phase one types of treatments. If it's a little bit longer um, than, you know, longer than three to six months or chronically ill person, you might want to ramp up to phase two treatments and then work your way backwards. Uh, I just saw a question pop up. If the patient is on low-dose naltrexone, uh, can they continue taking it during the treatment? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, LDN uh, is sort of a neutral thing with respect to this. Um, in, in many ways, it can, it can make the cytokine reaction that you see more uh, amenable, easier to deal with, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, no problem with low-dose naltrexone during treatment. Now, just a couple of things, and I want to see if there's any other uh, questions. There's a number of references that uh, I use to come up with many of these things. And um, then there's a bibliography Dr. Fry put together, which is really quite uh, a extensive. So uh, we'll be back to the third Tuesday of the month for our regular web calls. And we've got all kinds of stuff going on on the website. So these are the past web call topics that uh, we have. Now, I do want to just say that um, one of the, so we had been doing about two and a half years worth of uh, trial and error patient research with biofilms and different IV things and oral things, and I found all this biofilm stuff and all these other things. And then I happened to run into some biofilm research folks who are doing human work, and we compared notes. And the only difference between what I was doing and what they were doing is that they had millions of dollars for R&D. And because we had kind of, based on research, so-called stumbled upon a lot of the right answers, we were able to trade uh, information. And a lot of the cool stuff, like the bismuthiol complex things and some of that stuff, came from research that they enlightened me to that was really hard to find otherwise because most of that research is going on kind of in cloistered government areas and stuff like that. Uh, but I will say that, it, it, that adding this idea of phase two treatment and adding in oral potent phase two agents like bismuthiol complexes has been a game changer for most of our chronic infected patients. And that's kind of a, a, a pretty huge thing clinically that we have seen. So. We've got a, a few minutes here. If there's any questions, go ahead and uh, type them in. La, 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 la. Okay, so uh, how to assess, yeah, essentially where or how aggressive to be. It's, uh, this is the answer nobody likes. It's, it's completely clinical. There's no um, magic to it at all. Basically, if you have a patient uh, as I said, I think earlier maybe, um, if you have a patient who's been sick repeatedly but not over and over and over, um, you know, like, so by repeatedly I mean three to six months, not three to six years, 
then they're, but they've been otherwise healthy. I assume that they're kind of in a phase one state until I see that the treatment doesn't work. Uh, if I've got a patient that's got three, four, five, ten different uh, infections, they've been chronically ill for two, three, four, five, ten, twenty years, um, and they are very treatment resistant, I just go right to phase two and work backwards. So it's kind of on that end of the spectrum, uh, Susan. It's you know earlier, less chronicity than probably phase one's fine. Uh, more chronically ill, more treatment resistant. I just go to phase two and work backwards. Um, viewer one, do chronic viruses hang out in gut biofilms or somewhere else? Actually, based on the research that a lot of these, these very smart people are doing, EBV, uh, HSV, these other things, although that group of viruses really likes the nervous system and the liver, they will hang out in GI biofilms as well, so yes. The other thing is, is that the uh, ASO producing hemolytic uh, buds will also uh, hang out inside of the gut. We think of the hemolytic uh, streptococci as pharyngeal and vaginal, but they're also huge in the gut, which is why the ASOs go up high. Uh, hepatitis less is known about as far as the gut. Um, uh, so. I, I can't really answer hepatitis specifically as far as a research base. Uh, somebody asked about phage therapy. It's good data, but hard to get on target. My thought about phage therapy, because I've had people try it and do it and all that business, um, is um, that I think if it's coupled, like the phage therapies and, and any other infectious disease therapy, are coupled with assaulting biofilms are going to go further. I know that's sort of a tangential answer, viewer 17, to what you're asking, but I really think that phage therapy was probably better that way. Um, viewer 18 wants to know if I'll be seeing new patients again soon. Uh, probably unlikely, unless, unless I just want to die. Uh, so probably not in the very near future. Uh, Jeremy, go to phase one treatments. All right. You know, phase one, I, th I think of as um, uh, kind of, I, I like to combine things there, even though they all work through different mechanisms. Um, I have personally had the least benefit. It could just be because I have more chronically ill folks, but um, I have had the least benefit with high dose enzymes and I've had better benefit with things like uh, oregano, the, the aromatic uh, things, black cumin, oral calcium EDTA, stuff like that in phase one. So I'll, I'll use maybe um, like a product, you have no connection to this product, but like interphase plus, uh, and then I'll do that with like uh, ADP, which is Mexican oregano, uh, Jeremy, so that'd be kind of That'd be my beginning phase one treatment. Then I might cycle in some argentum, you know, the silver, hydrosol, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, viewer one makes a really good question, which is, has actually come up before in other forums, and that is what about chronic vaginitis? One of the things that there's a little bit of research on that I have actually seen at work um, reasonably well for is um, using uh, vaginal N-acetylcysteine. So chronic vaginitis that won't go away and you, you know, you're probably is a biofilm component. Um, vaginal N-acetylcysteine would be one way to start. One of the things that I've seen with chronic vaginosis vaginitis that has an infective component is there can be gut biofilms that are allowing uh, fungus and other dysbiotic bacteria and stuff to kind of stay in the system and then they recede to vagina once you get the treatment done. So I would probably do both um, uh, a, a, a vaginal NAC along with whatever else you're going to use as, as well as a GI uh, biofilm therapy. Uh, let's see, uh, if you are sus suspecting a biofilm component, how long do you treat before you expect to see an aggravation? You know, I'll, I'll say uh, number 21 there, uh, the aggravations that I've seen have tended to start somewhere between three and six weeks for most people. Um, 
I would not give up at three weeks because people who've had longer time to build them or weirder bugs or something like this, um, what I would do uh, is I normally tell people if we're really thinking there's a you know biofilm component year 21, um, I told them to, we're going to give it 60 days minimum. So that's going to be, you know, one week at the test post, and I'm going to ramp up kind of two, three, four pills a day, depending on their body size. And, and we're just going to watch and see what happens. Um, and, and I'm pretty judicious. I don't just give this to everybody. These are people that I have such a high suspicion or they've been so treatment resistant. So far, we've not had anybody who didn't react, but I suppose that could happen. Um, Laura asked a good question about NAC. What, what I have done with NAC is either had the patient mix it themselves in a, in a carrier you're mentioning like cocoa butter or something like that. That's a lot more uh, tissue friendly rather than, you know, you can do, kind of like we used to do with the boric acid suppositories and use an NAC. You're, they're going to get a lot more uh, tissue sloughing and a lot more fluid coming out. So something uh, that will keep the NAC stable and in contact with the tissues, but not direct or not completely directly, like uh, cocoa butter base is probably better. Um, so this is a really good question too, um, and we'll be doing some presentations on uh, SIBO, SIBO, however you like to say that in biofilms. Um, one of the things that some of the SIBO clinics uh, uh, kind of communicated with them about is in SIBO, there's a, a thought in the non-responsive patient um, that there's probably obviously other things uh, going in. So if the normal treatments for SIBO or SIBO are not working, usually the things that uh, are done is number one uh, and number two done together. One is to look at the genomics of the patient and see if they actually have the genomics for uh, for regeneration of the GI tissue. That's a whole other topic. But the other thing is a phase two biofilm treatment. And one, interestingly, uh, viewer 28 brings up about, about GI stuff and, and treatment responsive SIBO. Um, one of the researchers did a whole bunch of treatment using phase one uh, treatments with their non-responsive SIBO patients and they got very little response from it. Um, and when we started to use phase two treatments, again, a little bit more sturdy, we did start to get more traction with the treatment non-responsive. So I, I don't know if, if we know enough to say right now with a SIBO patient, we do, you know, biofilm treatment with everybody, def definitely the enzyme end of things and maybe other, you know, herbal things and stuff. But I think in the non-responders, you definitely want to do that. Um, I would basically continue, um, I think to answer the second half of your question, you were 20, I would continue the biofilm treatment and the anti-infective treatment until they can broaden their diet. So if the, if the SCD, either one of those patients that can't go off the diet and it's getting more narrow, I would continue the combo of anti-infective and biofilm treatment until they are able to tolerate more uh, foods. So if you're a nine, uh, chronic sinusitis, I usually start with uh, the BEG uh, spray, um, which is a Bacterban, EDTA, and Gentamicin. If you, you can just look up BEG, uh, BEG spray. Uh, all of the compounding pharmacies make it. And I've had patients where, you know, they've, they've got a high reservoir in their sinuses, and the, the BEG spray really you know, it kind of gets things rolling and makes a pretty huge difference. Um, I have not ever done an NAC sinus rinse because I can get a, you know, a sterile product from a pharmacy as a spray, a bag spray. So uh, viewer nine, I, I would I would do bag spray first. And then here, here's the thing, in chronic sinusitis people, a lot of times they have the same reservoir in the sinuses that they do in the lungs and the gut. So sometimes if I'm not getting anywhere with the sinuses, and the spray is working, but then it goes backwards and it's not working, then it works again. I would treat their gut as well from the biofilm point of view. All right, well, I sipped some water here because I'm losing my voice. Um, 
Any other questions? A good question. Uh, oh, I got two, oops, three, three in a row here. I'll start to do them. Um, <laughs> viewer number one wants to know how to get their name to show up instead of viewer number uh, You know, I actually, I do not know. Uh, we can have Andrew chime in on that and he can, he can tell you. Um, <laughs> Viewer 21, I know it's so impersonal, maybe it's better, you know, you, you don't want me to know who you are. Uh, viewer 21 asked about skin flares. Skin flares are huge, like not everyone has skin flares, all right? When, when I have flare-ups, you know, personally with infectious stuff, um, it, it goes right to my joints and I feel like I have arthritis and it's just horrible. It's very painful and all that stuff. I have patients where uh, it goes to their brain and they get anxious or they get depressed or something like that. Um, and then I have people where it goes right to their skin, so around their mouth flares up or, or you know, all over. They get rashy looking things. Um, skin flares, any flare up, what I have learned the hard way, meaning I've had people flare up and I didn't get ahead of it fast enough. They got, you know, they got kind of pissed off at me. Um, skin flare ups basically joint flare-ups, brain flare-ups, gut flare-ups, I go right to the adrenal support and either adrenal support or adrenal support plus hydrocortisone or those two plus a little bit of thyroid. Depending on what I think they need, I do that first and then, um, and then I see what I can do. And when you're doing the adrenal support or adrenal thyroid support, whatever that is that works for the patient, Normally, you have to kick up the intensity of the anti-infective. That could be a global thing. You know, I keep going back to like, you know, uh, um, you know, like oregano, olive leaf, those sort of more global things. Anything that works for your patient, that's one thing to do. Um, but, but basically, when you get flare-ups, whether it's gut, skin, joints, brain, you know, wherever, lungs, um, go to the adrenals first and adrenal thyroid stuff then work your way out to increasing the anti-infectives because that's really what it means. Uh, so Laura asks, uh, biofilms and blood vessels, talking about atherosclerosis, uh, how is the treatment different? And by the way, Laura, thank you for answering viewer number one's question on how to change their name because uh, I've never done this from the other side. So yeah, Laura, the. Um, the whole thing with atherosclerotic stuff, there's there's a component of based on uh, blood vessel biopsies and microscopy and all that business that is uh, biofilm related in many people, um, and essentially the biofilm treatment is very similar regardless of whether it's in the blood vessels or in the gut or wherever. Um, this is a largely unanswered question as far as being able to say it's for sure this treatment's the best thing or this other treatment's the best thing. Um, there is a researcher I've worked with who's, uh, who came from the NIH and is doing research in pathology and all this stuff, and they actually do clinical work, and they believe that um, uh, intravenous things for the blood vessel thing, and it would make sense because the intravenous treatment's going to get the blood vessels faster, they believe that has a bigger effect, but they're still trying to sort that out than, say, taking an oral treatment for cardiovascular stuff. So what they use is uh, EDTA. Uh, they use um, glutathione as the thiol. And what's interesting is EDTA followed by glutathione is our normal, um, you know, that's our normal ch chelation protocol order as well. So I guess it kind of makes some sense. Um, down here where I can read. Yeah, chronic skin stuff, it, it, you, 
I, I think it's worth a try if nothing else is working um, to consider, you know, biofilms. Because what's weird is I've had people where, you know, purportedly the GI effect from the biofilm agent and then the anti-infectives is the biggest effect, and they have no GI symptoms, but they react on their skin or they react in their joints or whatever. I don't think, you know, it's kind of like the SIBO thing. It wouldn't be the first thing I'd think of, but if nothing else is working, then I would say, yeah, I would, I would give it a try if you have chronic uh, skin inflammatory stuff, especially anything around the, the nose and mouth, face area, uh, chronic, potential chronic unrelenting infectious skin things, and even cytokine-driven inflammatory things. Let's see. How long does it usually take to break and clear biofilms when doing biosolv and antibacterials? So, you know, it, it's kind of an open question because while we've had a number of years to play around with this in real live patients and kind of get some feedback, it, it kind of goes back to what, what, what I answered to everything, which is um, if the patient's not been sick very long and I can get them back onto phase one things like enzymes and more stomach acid and, you know, uh, flavonoids and all that other good stuff, uh, I, I might only need three or four months of a heavy-duty biofilm thing, and then we keep the pressure on with more natural stuff. If it's like by like Pam's patients, Pam's Panda patients, or the, the the average Lyme patient, or you know those people that have been treated with 3,000 antibiotics and they're still not better, those people we might be banging away on pretty hard with phase two stuff over the course of a year and then do a withdrawal trial um, where we start to take away uh, something like biosolve, you know, business file complex, and uh, then move them to something um, like black cumin and oregano or, you know, something that's kind of in the middle, and then just see how they do. Um, because there's not really, I mean, unless you're actually doing tissue biopsies, there's not great testing for this. You have to just clinically monitor it. But if you have, you know, an early one um, uh, versus a later patient, I just do it longer with the more treatment-resistant patients. Uh, biofilms leaving, physically leaving the body, um, kind of depends because if you think about or if you look at, like, the chemistry of a biofilm, they have a life cycle where they actually fall off um, of the, um, like the blood vessels, and um, then they will, um, you know, metastasize to other areas. So what you want to do is actually break them up enough that their, their constituents, so the struct, the superstructure is broken down enough. So if it's in the gut, then that normally it goes out through the stool. If it's systemically, it's going to have to break down enough that it's going to be eliminated just like any other chemistry. Um, so that's the that's the answer there. Black cumin. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna look here. Uh, there's like I said. There's very few people who make it. So I think the last one that I was able to get a hold of was Life Extension, um, and they do make a black cumin. And then um, for people who do topical things, there's a couple companies that make an essential oil. Um, yeah. So there we go. All right. Any last uh, questions or comments you want to throw in? Very good question. So the question, sorry, I'm scrolling here. So if you're using um, that that life extension particular product, um, it winds up taking, and, and here's the thing, whether it's, uh, and, and I've seen this, I'll just make this comment across the board. 
the black cumin is a, it's pretty potent stuff, but I've also seen like ADP version of uh, oil of oregano is also pretty potent, and so is Gaia. So of all of those three, I kind of see them as pretty good middle-of-the-road agents. I start with one before food twice a day, and if they don't notice much, I go to one before food or two, two or three before food, excuse me, of any of those products two to three times a day until we get a reaction. So it's kind of like right before they eat, it gets in there before the food does and percolates through the stomach. So whether it's that um, life extension, black cumin, there, there's a, I can't remember, I apologize, I can't remember the name of the product right now. There's another one that I think is made by the same company, but different uh, product manufacturer. If I'm not seeing anything, then I'll kick it up two or three, three times a day. And if that doesn't really do anything and they've been sick for months or years, I'll go to a, uh, I'll go to a combo product. So the reactions to note are essentially all those cytokine driven things we we're talking about. And here's the problem that you, you have to warn your patient. In some people, it'll be all in their brain. They'll get anxious, they'll get depressed, they'll get tired, they'll get whatever, but it's new. In some people, it's only their skin. They're, they're around their mouth flares up, around their nose flares up. They get a sinusitis-like reaction. Their lungs get inflamed. Uh, they get, you know, their, their, what they thought was their eczema flares up. In some people, it will be that their joints get terribly inflamed. Um, and that, uh, that's another one. Some people who are unfortunate might get two or three of all of those things. Basically, just think of anywhere the cytokines can go, which is everywhere. And they're going to do something on the inflammatory end of the spectrum. But, but keep in mind, <clears throat> especially in pans and stuff like that, um, what you're really looking at is uh, the ability of the inflammation to go straight to the brain. So you do have to be careful, especially if they're suicidal. Um, how do the researchers figure out what a substance is doing to a biofilm? That's a terribly long answer, Becky. Um, and the the real answer to it is they know in those early stages that, you know, for instance, phenolics are going to hit one part and, um, you know, enzymes are going to hit the very early stages of attachment, blah, blah, blah. That's the reason why a lot of the phase one treatments just plain don't work because they, they only work in combination. Um, and so my... My advice would be if you're using some of those phase one treatments and you, you say and you're not getting any effects, probably not that they don't have biofilms. It's just you, the, that ship has sailed and, and uh, that's why they're lumped into phase one is because that's all they do is work on those early, those early uh, places. So then you have to go to the bigger, bigger guns. <clears throat> Yeah, the Chinese herbs are going to be basically the phase one agents as well. There's going to be probably some that are heavier um, that in the aromatic end of the spectrum that would, uh, you know, they'd be sort of like cumin, oregano, that end of the spectrum chemically um, that would get into the middle. Yeah, but if you get a late phase two, there's 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 no, I, I've seen no no direct clinical evidence of mine and certainly no evidence in research that you can do anything other than the heavier uh, combined things for phase two. They're just nothing else works. My experience using, you know, about 10,000 doses of IV artemisia and more than that of oral is it doesn't do anything in phase two like the other phase two stuff does. I know it looks good, but um, I, I know what the reactions look like of all these different things, and it's just very clearly different. It's still good for you, though. <laughs> all right. Just remember... Everything works. It just works at different times, and you don't have to stay at the big guns all the time, but sometimes you need them to, you know, kind of break the doors open, and then you can get in with all the other stuff, and it works better. All right, guys, I appreciate your time. This has been a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun putting this together, and I would also like to thank my patients 
and all the other people who did the uh, human research uh, and, and were very kind to share it with me. Um, mostly they shared it with me because I'd already figured most of it out experimenting on our patients. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording, and I'll see you all later somewhere. <laughs>